see my PowerPoint. Can all of you see this uh, presentation, the slide? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So shall we start then? Yes. Okay. Well, yes, ma'am. So as long as you can see the slides and you can hear me, it's all good. Fine to start. Hmm? Okay. Uh, let me begin by asking you something. Huh? So far, we uh, have done uh, four novels, right? Do you remember? We started off with Tom Jones, Henry Fielding's Tom Jones. Then we did Wuthering Heights, written by... Sorry, we did uh, Pride and Prejudice. The second one was Pride and Prejudice, written by... Jane Austen. Jane Austen. Jane Austen, yes. And what was the third one after that we did? Great Expectations. Great Expectations. Third one was Wuthering Heights. Third one was Wuthering Heights, written by written by who wrote Wuthering Heights? Anyone? Charlotte Bronte, right? One of the Bronte sisters. And why I'm asking you that is because uh, she did not, when she published the book, she did not write it under her own name. You remember we discussed how the writers used pseudonyms, right? They assumed the name of a man, a male, in order to get their books published. Because those days it was very hard for a woman to write and get published. So she used the name Elizabeth. She and her sisters, all of them, used pseudonyms or nom de plume or Raya, pen name. That's what it's called, okay? Pen name. So many, all of them used uh, these pen names. And uh, Charlie Bronte published it under the name Elizabeth. Okay? Uh, and now we have uh, the novel Middle March, okay? written by George Eliot. Now, George Eliot is not the real name of the writer. The real name of the writer, as you can see on the slide, to the left of the slide is, what is her name? You can read it there, Mary Ann Evans. That was the real name of the writer. She also assumed the pen name of George Eliot. Okay? Now, she was born on the 22nd of November, 1819, in Warwickshire in England. And she died uh, age 61 in the year.
Hi everyone. Actually, I want to ask. This is my first class, and I missed the previous classes. So, can I get the previous PPTs? Is ma'am sharing the PPTs? If anyone knows, please reply. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, sorry, I lost power here. And that's why I have to leave the meeting. I'm so sorry about that. Okay. Let's get back to the class. Okay. So, can you see this? Yes, ma'am. So, I was discussing how the writers often use male names in order to get their books published. So, our writer, maybe at Evans, used the name George Eliot. Okay. Now, let's go and look at the details about this novel. All right, Middle March. See, in full, the title of the novel in full was Middle March, A Study of Provincial Life, a novel by George Edward, uh, which is a pseudonym or pen name of Marianne Evans. Now, this was published in eight parts in 1871 to 72, and also published in four volumes in 1872. It's considered to be Eliot's masterpiece, the realist work of a study of the society in the town of Little March, from the landed gentry and clergy to the manufacturers and professional men, farmers and laborers. So, uh, like we uh, read in the beginning, you know, uh, the full title of the novel is Middle March, A Study of Provincial Life. So, a, a study is like a sketch, right? It's like a presentation of a wide variety of uh, people who uh, con who constitute a society. So you have uh, a lot of uh, different kinds of characters uh, presented in the novel. People who are from the landed community, the landed gentry, from the church, the clergymen. We have professionals, we have manufacturers and farmers and laborers. So we have uh, almost, we can say, like a cross-section of society. Characters forming a cross-section of society in this novel. Now the focus, however, is on the thwarted idealism of its two principal characters, Dorothea Brook and Tertius Lidgate, both of whom marry disastrous. So although we have a wide variety of characters, we can say that the focus, uh, George Eliot has focused uh, her attentions on two main characters who are actually the main characters of the novel. Uh, the name of the heroine is Dorothea Brook. And the other character is Lydgate, Dr. Lydgate. Okay, Dr. She's Lid. So the the uh, life and what happens to these two characters becomes the focus of the novel. Especially how they marry, having a lot of ideals in their head, and how that doesn't really work out in the way that they expected it to. So that is what this novel is about. And on the right side of the screen, you can see that cover page of Middle March and also. Look at some of the some of the works written by Eliot. Okay. Mill on the Floors in 1860s, Last Manor in 61, 
Ramola 62 to 63, Middle March 71 to 72, and Daniel de Ronda written in 1876. So these are the uh, major works written by Eliot. And for, uh, of that, the uh, one of the best ones we can say is Middle March, uh, in which the main characters are Dorothea Brook and Tertius Lindley. Going on to the next slide. Now, uh, Middle March presents the spirit of the Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. Yeah, I'm so yeah, sorry. Audible. Losing power and it's going and it's coming back. That's why I, I keep, uh, you know, getting off this uh, presentation thing. Okay. Let me go back uh, and try to present. Let's try to. So going back to the uh, presentation, I hope you can hear me and see me, okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. So uh, going back to this, uh, we were talking about middle March and uh, you know how uh, this is a kind of a reflection of the spirit of the 19th century England. Uh, 
through you know the common people that are presented in the novel so we get a picture uh, through the characters that we're going to meet in this novel we get a picture of how 19th century england was like now this was a time of rapid industrialization things were changing you know to the industrial mode faster than people could even understand social mobility was growing rapidly so uh, if there was always uh, the chance that you know if uh, you work hard and uh, you are able to you know deal with uh, the whole process of industrialization well you could make a lot of money which could mean that social mobility was uh, something that could happen pretty fast but with the rise of the merchant middle class one's birth no longer necessarily determined one's social class for life so uh, the merchant class was becoming more and more powerful that meant they had more money so that means the you know they need not actually belong to nobility in order to uh, be counted in society be counted as someone important in society now on the other side see there was no single coherent religious order there were a lot of uh, religious groups uh, often at war with each other we had evangelical protestants Catholics and Anglicans living side by side. As a result, religious conflicts abound in the novel. So different people with different religious uh, adherences. You know, so they have conflicts amongst each other, particularly those centering on the rise of evangelical Protestantism. So that was something which was coming up uh, pretty fast, a primarily middle class religion that created heated doctrinal controversies. So the middle class was rising up faster than ever, whether it's in the field of uh, social mobility or even in, for, in the area of religion. And that created lots of controversies. Now, Eliot deliberately locates the action of this novel in the three years that culminated to the passage of the Reform Bill of 1832. Following the American and French revolutions, demands for political reform increased in England. So this was the time when French revolution had happened and American independence, American war for independence had also happened. So people were aware that these things were happening in the world and there was an increasing demand for more reforms within the country of England. Now there was a growing belief in the rights of all Englishmen to participate in government whether they were property holders or not. So uh, everyone should be uh, given the rights for enfranchisement. That was what the people wanted, to participate in uh, government, uh, everyone, irrespective of whether they were landholders or not. Anglican clergy and landowners were the two groups staunchly opposed to this development. Uh, naturally, right, the church did not want this to happen. Uh, and also the landowners did not want everyone to get equal rights uh, or have a voice in how the government functioned. The first of the reform acts was passed in 1832. So nevertheless, the reform bills were passed and the first act of reform was passed in the year 1832. With the passage of this act, the aristocracy's political monopoly was broken forever. So aristocracy could no longer lord over the common man. They started having their own voice too. And about half of all land-owning middle-class Anglican men received the right to vote. So more uh, number of people were getting a voice in the government. Now, writing in the 1870s, Elliot knew of these changes. Not the, she was aware that these changes had happened in the laws. Uh, regarding succession, evolution of medicine, and the position of women in society. So uh, she she was you know she, she was writing in a period later than 1832. So she knew that these changes had already happened, and not only that you know medicine uh, changes were happening in the field of medicine. Changes were happening in the role of women in society, and all that finds echoes in what she writes. Now, going to the novel, okay, let's just have a look at what this story is all about. Now, Dorothea is an earnest, intelligent woman who makes a serious error in judgment when she chooses to marry Edward Passabo, a pompous scholar many years her senior. So, he's from, uh, he's a member of the clergy and he's much older than her. She makes a big error of uh, 
you know, error of judgment when she decides that she will marry this man who was very much older than her. She's an intelligent woman, you know, full of uh, the desire to do good for the whole world. But then she makes a miscalculation when she decides to marry this uh, man, Edward Passavo, a pompous scholar who was many years her senior. Dorothy hopes to be actively involved in this work, but he wants her to serve as a secretary. She comes to doubt both his talent and his alleged magnum opus. So uh, Dorothy wanted to be an equal partner with her husband and help him in writing his magnum opus, the mega work that he was attempting, the, the biggest uh, work of his life that he was attempting. But soon after marriage, she realizes that that's just not going to be possible. He doesn't regard her uh, as his equal, rather like, you know, a pesky uh, or an irritating secretary. That is the way in which he regards her. And not only that, she even loses belief in the, uh, in the level of the work that he was attempting. So that's what happens with the marriage there. Furthermore, the controlling Kasabon becomes jealous when she develops a friendship with Will Ladislaw, his idealistic cousin. So she meets uh, Kasabon's uh, cousin, Will Ladislaw, who's young, out of college, uh, yeah, just looking for a proper professional uh, engagement. At that time, she meets Will Ladislaw and uh, she becomes very friendly with him. She's uh, very much attracted to his charms, you know, his uh, jovial nature, his element of fun and uh, frivolity that uh, you know he's able to bring into this otherwise very dull life that Dorothea leads. Uh, and uh, Kosabon becomes very jealous of the friendship that develops between these two. Although disappointed, Dorothea remains committed to the marriage and tries to appease her husband. So uh, she feels bad that her husband feels jealous about her friendship with Will Ladislaw, yet she remains committed to the marriage and tries to make her husband happy. After Kosabon has a heart attack, Dorothea is clearly devoted to him, but he bars Ladislaw from visiting, believing that his cousin will pursue Dorothea when he dies. So he's uh, very insecure and he thinks that Dorothea might go with Ladislaw. Kosabon subsequently seeks a promise that she will follow his wishes even after his death. She delays an answering, but ultimately decides that she should agree to his request. So he's not doing well, he's already had a heart attack. And he may die, and he's worried that uh, Dorothea may go to Will Ladislaw after his death. So he kind of, you know, uh, makes her give a promise that she will do nothing of the sort. At first, she doesn't want to uh, promise, uh, give any promises to her husband. Yet later, she decides, okay, she will agree to what he says. However, before uh, before she can tell him, you know, he dies. Okay, Dorothea later discovers that his will contains a provision that calls for her to be disinherited she marries Ladislaw. So there is a codicil that he leaves. There is a, a provision in his will that she will be disinherited if she marries Ladislaw, even after his death. So he, he, he was rather like reaching beyond the grave to meddle and mess up the life of Dorothy. Afraid of scandal, Dorothy and Ladislaw initially stay apart. However, they ultimately fall in love and marry. Ladislaw later becomes a politician, and despite her sacrifice, sacrifices, Dorothea is content. So this is basically what the story is about. But they are not the only characters. There are other characters also. Now, during this time, Lid Lidgate's story unfolds. So along with the story of uh, Dorothea is also the story of this uh, doctor, Lidgate. He is a progressive young doctor who is passionate about medicine, especially his research. Soon after arriving in middle March, he becomes involved with and later marries Rosamond Vincy, whom he finds to be polished, refined, and docile. All qualities that he wants in a wife. So he is a very earnest doctor. He is into research, trying to find out the original cell that originated life. He is busy in his work. But then he meets beautiful Rosamond Vincy. He falls for her. He thinks that she is the perfect wife for him. Uh, he marries her for her part. Rosamond believes that marriage to Lydgate, who she does not realize is poor, will improve her social standing. So Rosamond is marrying Lydgate because she thinks he is rich and also he has a higher social uh, standing, social status. Lydgate comes to realize that he has made a mistake in choosing Rosamond. 
She's shallow, uninterested in his work, and her expensive lifestyle forces her husband to the brink of financial ruin. He seeks a loan from Nicholas Bulstrade, a widely disliked banker, but is refused. So um, she, he marries Rosamond, but then uh, he realizes that you know she is only after money. She's only after a show of wealth, and uh, to keep her happy, he has to spend more than he earns. He's he's working in a provincial town. His uh, his patients are not so wealthy. And he is not able to keep up with the demands of his life, which makes him, you know, reach the brink of utter financial ruin. And in order to keep floating, he has to take some money from this uh, rich banker called Nicholas Bulstrade. Okay, he is a very disliked banker. He, he is not completely trustworthy. He asked for a loan, but he is refused. Then, uh, coming, going on to another thread in the story. Rosamond's brother Fred gets into financial troubles by gambling. So uh, Rosamond has a brother called Fred, and he's a good person, but he also, you know, wastes a lot of a lot of his money. He goes gambling and he loses a lot of money. He expects to inherit his uncle Featherstone's money and land, but when the miser dies and leaves his property to his illegitimate son, Fred is forced to finish university and face the necessity of becoming a clergyman. So Fred was banking on getting the inheritance of his uncle. But the uncle, when he dies, leaves all his property and wealth to his illegitimate son, leaving Fred with nothing. And faced with this uh, situation, Fred has no choice but to go into university, finish his education, and probably join the church. Now, as a person, his... Uh, his uh, uh, his personality is not something that would make him a good uh, clergyman. And who knows it better than the woman he loves, Mary Carr. Okay, She knows it very well that Fred is unsuited for the church. And she tells him that if he goes into the church, she will not marry him. See, The woman that he loves, Mary Carr, will not marry him if he takes up a vocation he is clearly not suited for. And she is waiting for him to become a responsible adult. So she wants him to do something, some work in which he finds delight and uh, live a respectable life. Mary's father agrees to take Fred on as an apprentice to learn the business of land management, which affords Fred the opportunity of a profession and a job, to, uh, a job so that he can marry Mary. Okay. So uh, it's Mary's father, Caleb, this is me, uh, who agrees to take Fred as an apprentice, show him how he can work, earn a living through his work, through which he might be able to marry Mary. Going on. Now, Bulstrade has his own problems. Okay, He's a banker, like I just mentioned. He's being blackmailed by John Raffles, who knows about Bulstrade's unsavory past. So Bulstreet has a dark past that he wants to hide from the people in that village. And uh, Raffles uh, is a man who comes there and he knows the past of Bulstreet. So uh, Bulstreet is not very easy when uh, Raffles is there because he's scared that Raffles will tell everyone the truth about his past. Now when Raffles becomes ill, Bulstreet ten tends to him and sends for Lydgate. So Raffles becomes ill and Bulstrade is the one who is taking care of him. And Bulstrade sends for the doctor, Lidgate, to come and check out uh, Raffles. During one of the doctor's visits, Bulstrade offers to lend Lidgate the money he had previously refused. And Lidgate accepts. Okay? So uh, remember Lidgate had gone to Bulstrade earlier to ask for money and he was refused. But one of the visits, you know, when he goes to Bulstrade, Bulstrade's house in order to visit Raffles, Bulstrode says that, okay, I will give you the money that you had asked from me. And he accepts, Lidgate accepts. The Bulstrode subsequently disregards Lidgate's medical instructions, causing Raffles to die. So uh, Lidgate had given certain instructions to be uh, followed strictly in order to take care of the patient, but Bulstrode does not listen to that and Raffles passes away. Now, when the true story about Bulstrode and Raffles comes to light, 
questions arise over ligates possible involvement in the latter's death so when people come to know that raffles died because ligate did, because bulstray did not take good care of him then they start the people start questioning the uh, the honor of this doctor ligate also so ligate's reputation also comes under question after the death of raffles one of the few people who believes his innocence is dorothea and he is taken by her compassion and kindness ligate and rosamond are ultimately forced to leave middle march and they move to london where ligate becomes wealthy but considers himself a failure so because of his wife and her desire for a wealthy lifestyle lidgate eventually has to leave uh, you know middle march leave the place middle march and shift to london he becomes a wealthy doctor but he has to sacrifice all his ideals and his enthusiasm for research with which he had come to middle march all that changes for lidgate now what is bulstrode secret what is uh, let's look into his unsavory past He married the elderly widow, widow uh, Mrs. Dunkirk, and deliberately concealed the location of her daughter Sarah, so that he would inherit her wealth. So, a uh, Bulstrode secret is this: he had married a, a woman, a widow called Mrs. Dunkirk, who had a daughter called Sarah, who had run away from home, and uh, Mrs. Dunkirk had asked Bulstrode to find out where exactly is Sarah, and Bulstrode. Bulstrode knew where is uh, Sarah, yet he conceals the location of Sarah so that after the death of uh, Mrs. Dunkirk, he will inherit all the wealth. So that he was very greedy for uh, you know all the money that Mrs. Dunkirk would give him. Now, Bulstrode located the daughter and her child, Sarah and her child. The child was none other than Will Ladislaw, uh, but he kept her existence a secret. He bribed the man he hired to find her, John Raffles, to keep quiet. So, uh, Ladislaw was the uh, child of uh, Mrs. Dunkirk's daughter, Sarah. So, rightfully, he would be the inheritor of all the money that Bulstrode has. But Bulstrode keeps this whole thing a secret, and Raffles was the one who knew the truth. So that is why the presence of Raffles made Bulstrode uh, very uneasy. And what he wanted for uh, Raffles to keep quiet. Now look at the character map here. Uh, see, we have uh, Dorothea Brooke, who's an ardent, ardent idealist, uh, selfless, uh, and uh, and she settles for wifehood. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Pardon? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You are audible. <clears throat> okay, great. Because I mean, I I did, I was not sure whether I had lost power again. Although I have connected it with a different source now. Let's. See. So Dorothea uh, Brooke is the main character, and she is an uh, ardent idealist. She's like oh, an avowed idealist. She settles for wifehood, and. Uh, On one side, we have uh, Kasabon, who's a husband. Uh, he's a failed author and also a failed husband, right? They are spouses. But then her soulmate is Will Ladislaw. He's a rebel. He's a non-conformist and ends uh, ends a ends a uh, uh, finds a career and her soulmate. So Dorothea and Will Ladislaw are soulmates. Then uh, Dorothea and Lil. Lidgate, Doctor Lidgate, are friends. So, see, exceptional doctor fails to meet his potential. This is how we can uh, describe Lidgate, exceptional doctor who really fails to meet his potentials. And uh, his spouse is Rosamond Vincy Lidgate, a shallow social climber and a narcissist, totally taken up with her own self. Uh, she thinks the world uh, revolves around herself. Exact uh, typical narcissist person, and on the other side you have his close friend Camden Fairbrother, who is a beloved clergyman. Then uh, you have uh, the relationship uh, that they have with Nicholas Bulstrode. 
okay he's a religious hypocrite and a wealthy banker so uh, they are uh, partners in philanthropy but uh, of a different kind and uh, balstrode and fairbrother are adversaries okay now uh, nicolas balstrode is also the uncle of rosamond wilsey lectured so this this is uh, uh, you know uh, a character map of some of the main characters that you will see in this novel now uh, there are things that are you know that kind of uh, unite lidgate and dorothea their idealism their passion and also what losses that they suffer so uh, on the side of dorothea see she wants to perform great deeds for mankind and uh, tertius lidgate also wants to you know do some research that will make medical breakthroughs so both are idealistic as far as passion goes she chooses a husband who appears learned and wise so she prefers uh, to be in the company of uh, a man who she thinks is intelligent whereas uh, lidgate in the sense you know see he chooses a wife who appears gentle and beautiful but they are both mistaken isn't it by their choices for so sabon is uh, anything but wise and uh, rosalmond is anything but uh, really gentle and beautiful then uh, the losses that they suffer see stymie by her oppressive husband but finds herself after his death so she is very much restricted and confined by uh, the husband that she has chosen to give her life to and as far as lidgate is concerned see he is also uh, completely completely ruined because of the demands uh, by his wife which leads to debt and scandal in his life so this is the way in which we can compare these two central characters in the novel going on we have to uh, find out you know, what do different critical approaches say about the novel so we starting with the critical uh, approaches um, taken by henry james he was enchanted with the social realism of people solid and vivid in their varying degrees a deeply human little world like we mentioned earlier in this novel you find uh, the world of uh, multiple characters from all strata of society and that is something that really uh, enchanted you know uh, this critic henry james and he was equally impressed by eliot's broad reach of vision the brain behind her observation yet like other critics he found the plenitude of middle march too much to take in so although as a critic he was impressed by the sense of observation that went behind uh, behind drawing portraits word portraits of so many different types of people who belong to middle march he was also overawed by the plenitude too much of you know like plenty too much of um characters that you know you had to take in in order to go through middle march so this is both its plus point and also somewhat you know uh, which makes it hard to understand and uh, plow through i guess what henry james felt so uh, as writers uh, you know writers are generally people who have a very accurate and strong sense of observation so that has actually come to the help of uh, george eliot because she was able to portray so many different characters while that is very impressive at times it also gets very difficult to take in that is why he says that you know he found the plenitude a little bit too much to take in now going on to another uh, critical approach by virginia wolf the writer Uh, Virginia Woolf, for instance, claimed for Middle March the status of the magnificent book, which, with all its imperfections, is one of the few English novels written for grown-up people. This came in the Times Literary Supplement on the twentieth of November, nineteen ninety. So, form, content, ethics, morality is inextricably linked in George Eliot's art. So, these are things that you cannot. Uh, take one away from the other you find form and the matter and questions of ethics and morality all of this uh, forming the social structure of the novel 
so uh, virginia wolf loved it very much she said this is you know one of the few english novels written for grown up people while critics in the 60s and 50s accepted the third person narrative and the authorial authority of george eliot modern critics like terry eagleton felt uh, have felt that mm -hmm. middle march is fraught with discontinuities and disjunctions with george eliot is strenuously forcing into an artificial balance so uh, uh, critics in the 50s and 60s they uh, enjoyed the third person uh, narrative you know, uh, in a from a removed perspective a third person uh, narrative and also the authority of the author in discussing the characters and what happens to them uh, so 60s and 50s it was accepted but then modern critics like terry eagleton they feel that you know there are lots of discontinuities and breaks that happen disjunctions uh, that happen in the novel which george eliot uh, tries to bring about into kind of an artificial balance so that is the view of terry eagleton now why does uh, this critic feel like that see the reason Eliot problematic relation with the church and the consequent debates in her mind about secular values versus religious values and the conflict of social obligation with individual fulfillment so this is always been there you know the conflict between uh, the church and uh, secular values the church versus secular values values uh, like religious values versus social obligation of individual Uh, fulfillment so uh, these things are always uh, been conflicting things in her own life in the life of the writer she uh, actually broke a lot of uh, uh, rules and uh, strictures of society by choosing to live her life in her own way so you can say that you know her relationship with church was something which was always uh she she asked a lot of questions she did not hesitate to question uh, the church and its ways the word debates in her mind then uh, as far as social obligation you know how much did it actually conflict with individual fulfillment that was also something which was a debate going on in her mind now new interpretations of middle march deconstruct the text by challenging its obvious surface meanings by हेलो मैम मैम यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल
हेलो यस मैम आई एम सो सॉरी ओके आई एम सो सॉरी माय पावर लाइन इज प्रीटी मेस्ड अप टुडे आई हैड टू चेंज माय कंप्यूटर आई एम ऑन अनदर इंस्ट्रूमेंट लेट मी सी आई कैन स्टार्ट शेयरिंग लेट्स गो बैक टू व्हाट वी वर डिस्कसिंग ओके बेयर विद मी फॉर जस्ट अ मिनट Okay, can you see this? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, let me go to my slide. Yeah, this is what I was discussing with you, right? So we were uh, talking about how critics in the fifties and sixties were. Uh, dealing with you know looking at uh, eliot's middle march and they they were uh, they accepted the third person narrative and the authorial authority of george eliot but when it came to later critics modern critics like terry eagleton they felt that middle march is something uh, which is fraught with which has a lot of discontinuities in it and eliot is sort of you know with her narration trying to hold it all together Uh, in an artificial balance now the reasons for this was that eliot herself had a lot of uh, debates in her mind regarding uh, you know her identity versus where she stands with relation to the church uh, then her uh, commitment towards social norms and her individual fulfillment these were all contradictory conflicting thoughts that were happening in her own mind now from a deconstructive angle Okay, this critic called David Lodge, he uh, he said, you know, like this is uh, some something that is part and parcel of how we interpret the text, right? See, when the new interpretations of Middle March came into being, they started deconstructing the text uh, by challenging the surface meanings by keeping in view that the other is also constructed by a series of personal and intellectual experiences so no other writes in a vacuum and other is also part and parcel of the society in which he or she exists so when you deconstruct what is happening in the text we can say that the other is the one who has experienced these things and is writing about it so that is the reasoning that you see in david lodge's deconstructive reasoning see it's precisely because the narrative narrator's discourse is never entirely unambiguous predictable and in total interpretive control of the other discourses in middle march that the novel survives so the uh, the author is not in full control of the way in which this can be interpreted right as time passes there are more and more interpretations that can come in so the narrator this course is not something that is absolute and unambiguous and predictable there are ways in which this can be interpreted and the author is not even trying for total interpretive control over what is happening in middle march and it is precisely because of this ability that the novel survives to be read and reread without ever being closed or exhausted because each time we read it we can find new meanings in it now going to the next slide here feminist now uh, what are the feminist ideas about this book so earlier critics were likely to see feminism as a muted presence in middle march 
wherein patriarchal structures controlled the choices available to women. Contrast was noted between acceptances enacted by her heroines and George Eliot's own defiance of traditional restrictive forces by Zelda Austen's essay, Why Feminist Critics Are Angry with George Eliot. <coughs> so uh, uh, earlier critics, uh, feminist critics, earlier feminist critics were likely to see feminism as not a very uh, blatant or loud voice in Middle March. It's more like a muted voice within Middle March because in Middle March you find patriarchal structures uh, very controlling and uh, choices that were given to women were very few and finite. Now, uh, contrast was noted, you know, uh, between the acceptances enacted by her heroines. Her, her heroines are not very rebellious in that sense. So this was something that uh, was noted by feminist critics and especially there was this book written by, there was this essay written by this critic called Zelda Austin. She wrote this essay called Why Feminist Critics Are Angry with George Eliot. Uh, because they felt that the heroines were more uh, traditional and ready to accept the restrictive forces laid on them by society or the patriarchal norms. But then later feminist readings of Middle March have often investigated the text from socio-psychological base to discover Eliot's questioning of dominant structures where women are denied active and constructive roles in society. So later on, feminists were ready to uh, find that Eliot is asking questions. Eliot does raise valid points regarding a woman's role in society. The text draws attention to the underpinnings of gender inequity showing harmony as a precariously balanced condition resting upon a woman's deference to social form. The text subverts institutions such as marriage and family on which conventions are grounded. Seen from this angle, text can be said to raise feminist consciousness. So harmony is something, you know, from the novel we see that harmony is a, a condition, a balancing condition, which is balanced very precariously resting upon how a woman pays deference to a woman accepts social form. Uh, so seeing it like that, we can say in a way the text is subverting, turning upon itself, you know, institutions such as marriage and family on which these conventions are grounded. And from this angle, we can say that, you know, in her own way, Eliot is raising questions regarding feminine uh, consciousness or feminist positions. Firstly, why does the novel attract so much admiration as well as criticism? Secondly, to what extent does Middlemarch belong to history and still escape the constraints of time? Third question that rises up in our mind as we read the book. Thirdly, see how effectively is the woman's question delineated in the exploration of gender relations presented in the novel? And finally, how does the structure contribute to the complexity of the issues, themes, and ideologies debated in the novel. So let's go ahead and read more about this. Let's first begin with her life now. Okay, Mary Ann, or uh, George Eliot, began her scholar's life as a pious young woman in boarding school. But she soon had to return home upon her mother's death in order to look after the house for her father. Uh, their house was in this place in England called Coventry. In the years of sudden responsibility and consequent maturing, she read extensively into the relationship between the Bible and science and learned to question traditional piety. She broke with her father because she refused to attend church. So something which was very brave uh, for a woman in her time to do, right? She, she refused to attend church and she actually broke up with her father for that. Uh, but that was, that came from her reading, you know, uh, she, it's not because she was unaware of what was in the Bible. She did read the Bible extensively and she was also very much informed about development in science and that is how she started questioning traditional piety and that is how she refused to go to church and she broke up with her father. Mary Evans then met the famous journalist George Henry Lewis, who guided her reading in philosophy, religion, history, and invited her to express her views on several controversial subjects, 
by 1854 evans decided to defy convention and live openly with lewis so in those days you know uh, living together what we call today as living together without wedlock was something that was quite scandalous but mary evans was convinced for, about what she was doing and she did not care what the society thought about her so by 1854 she started living openly with lewis in all but the legal sense it was a marriage they were not legally married they were living together but it was like a marriage and the partnership continued happily until the death of lewis in 1878 they shared a learning and scholarship and read each other works and gained by their intellectual and emotional bond so there was a relationship based on their uh, shared interest of reading pursuit of knowledge and sharing what they read the intellectual connections uh, led to emotional bond and it was as good as a marriage and it lasted until lewis passed away in 1878 so she, here like a feminist criticizer we definitely do have our answers here first of all she was convinced enough in her own opinions to boycott the church to stop going to church and she was also uh, convinced in her own decision had her own uh, strength in her own self that she uh, chose to live openly with the man she loved eliot's novels though holding a common theme of exploring the limits of provincial society depict interplay between environment and moral choice uh, the environment is you know always there right where we grow up in what situation we uh, are that kind of determines the decisions we take the moral choices are all uh, sometimes you know determined by the environment also now during the writing of middle march george eliot was struck with writer's block but at this time she started writing a story about miss brook going deep into the psychological compulsions of an idealistic woman that is our heroine dorothea brook critic f r lewis was to say george eliot tends to identify herself with dorothea though dorothea is far from being the whole of George Eliot. So we do find elements of George Eliot herself in the character of Dorothea Brooke, uh, especially because this was uh, uh, writing about Dorothea as a character was something that she started doing when she was going through a bout of writer's block and she was st- uh, stuck and she couldn't write much. So this was something where she poured her heart and soul into, you know, the character of Dorothea Brooke. Now Miss Brooke's dreams of social improvement. are articulated within an old provincial society that is passing through rapid change and people discuss achievements of a talented dr lidgate an outsider to middle march who seen as harbinger of modern science so look at uh, the character of miss brook like this you know someone who dreams of social improvement uh, and uh, it is in a place like middle march which is very old provincial society uh, and if that even such a society was going through a lot of rapid change and a doctor with modern ideas and thoughts and research methodologies is discussed you know uh, as a person who has come to live in middle park march then the small town of middle march itself became the subject of inquiry with the complex dynamics of class and gender woven in so reviews were largely favorable and she was only allowed to mainly read those favorable reviews okay so as a writer she was allowed to read only the favorable reviews but generally it was favorable also and uh, the prelude to middle march st teresa and miss brook so the novel opens with a statement of connection between 16th century carmelite nun st teresa of avila and dorothea brook the central character in the story of middle march st teresa whose original name was teresa di cepeda e humada was born in 1515 in avila and spent her life in spain practicing and preaching the doctrine of austere contemplative life she was one of the great mystics of the roman catholic church a woman leader and author of several spiritual classics as the initiator of the carmelite order she restored and emphasized the observances of poverty and abstinence as the nuns dedicated themselves to the service of community uh, she insisted upon subsistence only through public alms uh, ensuring active contact between workers and 
society so this is how the novel begins you know comparing uh, dorothea to saint teresa of avila and saint teresa of avila is uh, described uh, in the book as saint teresa foundress of nothing but in truth she was uh, far from a being a foundress of nothing you know she was a very dynamic woman who was responsible for finding the carmelite order of nuns and she was the one who actually uh, laid the ground uh, rules for you know observing poverty and abstinence amongst the nuns of the carmelite order uh, but then eliot when she is using saint teresa uh, eliot is still using saint teresa legend for her own purposes and to talk about the difficult situations women must face eliot uses uh, saint teresa a foundress of nothing to refer to saint teresa though in reality saint teresa established and nurtured more than 16 convents in spain and inspired saint john of cross to initiate carmelite reform for men she had powerful supporters like king of spain and pope but eliot's point was not about that aspect of the nun the powerful aspect of the nun eliot's point however remains that women struggle against external circumstances so in order for a woman to be heard and respected and valued a woman has to uh, struggle a lot so that was the connection that uh, eliot wanted to have you know between her character dorothea and saint teresa although saint teresa was a very powerful now then uh, f r lewis another critic states that dorothea to put it in another way is a product of george eliot's own soul hunger another day dream ideal self so this there is a soul hunger that the author faces and dorothea is a picture of that soul hunger it is this uh, soul hunger that makes dorothea see cosabon as a winged messenger so she thinks that cosabon is an angel a, a winged messenger in fact it's nothing like that right the argument is a familiar one in 19th century fiction where themes are often worked by means of a chronological trajectory denoting a transition from innocence to experience ignorance to knowledge and even romance to realism so we can say that she began the, with this idealistic almost romantic notions and soon uh, as the marriage progressed she realized that she was badly mistaken so this this is a familiar argument in the 19th century fiction where we often see this chronological trajectory you know to chrono chronology time okay talking about time chronos is a greek god of time chronology comes from that so uh, chronological trajectory how how uh, the characters pass from innocence to experience from ignorance to knowledge and even romance to realism so likewise we find dorothea passing through all these stages because she realizes once she is married to cosabon that marriage is nothing like she had imagined it to be so other critics feel lewis has made an ethical criticism more than artistic so fr lewis uh, talking about soul hunger uh, you know other critics feel that this is more about ethics rather than uh, an artistic criticism then however the world of novel cannot be subjected to absolutist comments on morality and ethics that belongs to the discourse of social interaction in a given historical time so we cannot have uh, absolutist comments like you know this is correct this is not correct this is uh, you know uh, this is something that can be done this is something that cannot be done it does not happen like that in real life right so we cannot uh, subject the novel as a work of art to be subjected to absolutist moralist mo moralistic comments about ethics then arnold kettel another uh, um, critic feels that while the text remains finite the text of uh, reading of the text undergoes change as readers impose their own understanding of a changing world on it so uh, the text at one particular point of time could be interpreted in a particular way but as time passes as as readers uh, readers change you know with the passing of time readers and their sensibilities change and arnold kettle feels that you know the text can remain finite but the interpretation can be numberless it can be infinite uh, depending on how the re readers of uh, different ages 
view the text. Eliot remarks that the common yearning of womanhood is a vague idea. The subtext that we read through feminism helps us to understand, to comprehend that the vagueness or lack of formulation is caused by women's subservient position in the hierarchical structure, be they secular or religious. So there is this common yearn, yearning of womanhood that you find, you know, expressed in these uh, characters. But it's a vague ideal. There is nothing clear cut in Eliot's book like that about uh, this ideal of womanhood. So uh, Eliot feels that, you know, uh, reading it through this uh, subtext rather than, you know, what is explicitly written, what is uh, unspokenly written. You know, when you read it like that, you understand that. Uh, this vagueness itself is a result of uh, the woman's subservient position in the hierarchical structures, uh, whether they are in the secular world or in the religious world. Thus, joining Dorothea and St. Teresa points to a relevant question of gender oppression. So, uh, St. Teresa, being from the religious order, might have, uh, might have had to face you know, uh, gender, uh, gender, sub, uh, gender repressive uh, agents or uh, forces, just as Dorothea from the secular uh, field also might have uh, faced. So this ideal of womanhood becomes vague because that was the position that was uh, given to women during those times. Now, going to the next topic, uh, what are the themes in Middle March? Uh, one is the theme of vocation. Okay, the, the work that one is uh, cut out for. This mainly is illustrated by Dorothea Brook and Tertius Lidgay, but has vital connections to Cossabon's failed intellectualism, Bulstrode's fraudulent success, Fair Brothers' precarious ministry, and Mary Garth's caregiving. Each one is uh, committed to and passionate about what they believe in. That is a theme of vocation in that. Now, another theme that comes up here is marital compatibility, or rather the marital, incompa marital incompatibility. Uh, Dorothea and Lidgate, Rosamond, Vincy, Kosovo, Will Ladislaw are all characters that are used to illustrate the gap between dreams and the realm of possibilities. Right? So uh, none of the marriages that you see here actually work, right? Then, uh, money and pecuniary interests. Lidgate's idealism flounders on Rosamond's enchantment with beautiful things. Dorothea's disregard for Possebon's money. So, uh, money and interests regarding wealth. Okay, two examples. One is how Lidgate's idealism suffers, breaks, flounders because of Rosamond and her enchantment with everything that is expensive. Uh, and uh, on the opposite side, you have uh, Dorothea disregarding Cossabon's wealth because he lays a codicil that she cannot pursue Will Ladislaw even after his death. But Dorothea is not bothered about Cossabon's inheritance. So you have two opposite sides of the uh, uh, you know, spectrum there. Then uh, the questions of the theme of birth, rank, and class. So they were strongly divisive factors. Dorothea Ladislaw Union is forbidden. Example is Dorothea Ladislaw Union. Forbidden there. Garth and Vincy families. Uh, Fred Vincy, he's a lovable but irresponsible young man. Has expensive habits but no money. A tragic outcome is that he is almost forced into a religious vocation entirely unsuited to his temperament. So, uh, uh, Mary Garth, who loves him, is the one who actually sets his life straight by uh, giving him, uh, you know, this um, goal to reach to. Otherwise, he would have, uh, you know, drifted into a profession which he had no uh, interest in at all. Then, uh, politics. Politics in a literary work is like the gunshot in the middle of a concert, something vulgar and however, something which is impossible to ignore. Spread the writer's tent. Tenth all. Okay. Uh, constant references to reform will bring the politics of social change directly into the novel. British parliamentary bills have became acts in 1832, 1867, 1884, and 85, enfranchising less wealthy segments of society. 
in all the upper levels of property holders the nobility and gentry lost their hegemony to democratic forces so this uh, as far as politics is concerned this is what happens on the novel time then uh, the hegemony the sole power of the landed uh, aristocracy was fast losing ground and the common man was getting more and more rights especially the 1832 reform bills and the subsequent bills that were passed then fines uh, another theme you know in middle march the theme of fines contested systems of knowledge both old and new so this was a time when science was coming up more than ever and everything was under questioning uh, every system of knowledge was under questioning example lidgate welcome for his medical expertise later falls from grace for many reasons one is conservative resistance so just as we see that modern science was developing lidgate is the example for that just as we see that we also see how he falls from uh, grace or he falls from favor and that is particularly because of conservative resistance so people are uh, the senior doctors uh, uh, and other patients are very uh, skeptical about the new uh, things the new uh, knowledge that lidgate stands for then some other themes uh, in middle march theme of religion so george eliot rebelled against orthodoxy right we read earlier how she refused to go to church religion and politics merged in the small world of middle march as personal affiliations gained precedence and evoked fierce loyalty the egotism uh, tradition linked to excess of pride and vanity egotism comes from uh, a too much of pride and vanity sense of self right however in terms of psychological vocabulary the term ego as freud and jung have uh, used it becomes an attribute of normal human behavior it is a particularized i which distinguishes an individual this is the time of sigmund freud and you might have heard of id ego and super ego where id is the unrepressed self ego is the sense of i sense of self or the i there particularized i what makes me me what makes you you right our own individual identities so it's a particularized i which distinguishes an individual in modern psychology ego is a self determining component in the individual will to succeed so ego kind of becomes what is our personality uh, what is it that decides whether we succeed or whether we do not succeed so individual will uh, which makes us succeed or not uh, and so egotism uh, it becomes different from the traditional uh, description of it as excess of pride and vanity it becomes a representation of individual personality Uh, now it is, it is this what helps to analyze rosamond lidgate dorothea to honest factors motivating their actions their self centeredness which fails to see a dialectical that is acting through opposing forces relation between individual and society so uh, whether it is character of rosamond who acts uh, totally in a self centered way or even dorothea or lidgate they all think from their own perspective and that kind of acts uh, in opposition to what is uh, what is expected of them by society so that which leads to conflict uh, the prime of miss brook so the apparent positioning of dorothea on a low scale of expectation even as she is admired for an elevated sense of service to the community so uh, she is uh, admired for her sense of service to the community get as a woman she is uh, placed with only a very low scale of accept, uh, expectation now uh, in this regard we have to talk a little bit about the reader response theory an american critic stanley fish Uh, he is the one who talked about reader response theory so this is what he said meanings are not extracted but made and made not by encoded forms but by interpretive strategies that call forms into being so the way we interpret a book is what calls the forms into being the, the forms of interpretations arise from how we approach a book 
a reader's response to what is being read yet our responses are created from our subjectivity and are not entirely free our responses are based on what we have seen what we have lived the environments in which we live right so we are su- we are subjective in the way in which we approach a book and uh, we are not entirely free in our uh, response to a book also now george eliot <clears throat> directs the reader's imagination by presenting vivid descriptions of the characters outside uh, outward demeanor uh, and uh, inner personality uh, the modern day reader is not willing to remain a passive recipient of authorial control so uh, uh, george eliot as a writer is you know c- kind of directing the reader's imagination by presenting you know uh, to us uh, descriptions of the outward uh, outward behavior and inner personality of a char- character yet the modern reader does not want to you know be a passive recipient of what the author asks them to think they want to come to their own conclusions further to the remarks of stanley fish theoreticians such as umberto eco umberto eco points out between the intention of the author and intention of the interpreter there is a third possibility there is an intention of the text so reader makes the text his or her own by excavating the hidden wealth of meaning uh, when you understand the text in your own way uh, we can say that you have unearthed the hidden wealth of meaning from the text which is yours own right so uh, there is something that the author has intended when the author writes there is something that we uh, the interpreter has when they try to interpret that intention uh, the author's intention they try to interpret that then there is something which is contained within the text and that comes out when as readers we uh, come to a relationship with the text when we have uh, uh, when we make our own uh, meaning and kind of uh, act like archaeologists excavating and finding out its meaning and coming to terms with it coming to a relationship with it so that is what a uh, reader response theory is about hmm? then in the beginning of middle march george eliot seems to prophesy tragedy for a woman whose lofty ideas must collide with the limitations of a provincial town but when focus turns on societal constraints on a woman things change uh, so uh, it when the middle march starts you know george eliot seems to say talk about you know uh, a woman and uh how tragic it must be for her because she has these lofty ideas that could you know co- come into collision with the limitations of a provincial town but uh when uh, when the focus changes you know it becomes uh, what society con- what what constraints that society uh, uh puts on a woman and everything changes with that right Dorothea's ideas about marriage were too idealistic, too unrealistic, and Dorothea, with all her eagerness to know the truths of life, retained very childlike ideas about marriage. The really delightful marriage must be that where your husband was sort of a father and could teach you even Hebrew if you uh, so wanted it. This was how she thought, you know, about marriage. So we understand, you know, this was too idealistic. not anything like the reality was uh, uh but see it, this is what she thought you know they are very child like ideas about uh, marriage thinking that you know husband should be something like a father who would teach so uh you can say she went into marriage not exactly knowing what was marriage the unsuitable suitor kasabon an aged scholar almost 27 years older than dorothea Uh, their courtship is described very really often as one of the driest courtships in literary history his idea elevation of thought and capability of devotedness and she gladly dreams of a life of usefulness as a man who is an intellectual companion and devoted wife which doesn't happen george eliot had warned us about dorothea style like notions and how dorothea shies away from contemplating any adult aspect of marriage which was necessarily deal with 
sexuality, mothering, domestic arrangements, social commitments, etc. But Dorothea did not see marriage like that. She uh, did not take into consideration the aspects of sexuality or mothering or domestic arrangements, etc. She went into marriage with very childish notions. Dorothea's soul hunger uh, is contrasted with the vibrant materiality of her sister Celia, who enjoys fine clothes and jewels. So they are two very contrasting uh, figures, you know. Dorothea, uh, not at all materialistic. Celia, just the opposite, very materialistic. Dorothea is drawn to the dwells, but finds such covetousness inappropriate in herself, thereby bringing out contradictions in her idealism. So you find, uh, although she was idealistic, although she was not materialistic, she does uh, have a side of her that enjoys uh, the richness of the jewels, the richness of the fine clothes. So we can say that, you know, there are contradictions in Dorothea's character, uh, in the idealness of the, uh, or the, you know, uh, non-materialistic way in which she is described. There are contradictions within that. And the example is how she reacts to the jewels. Uh, Celia is uh, unapologetically materialistic. But uh, Dorothea has a side to her which enjoys it. Now, the world beyond. Uh, so to integrate different happenings in Middle March, a dinner party, you know, is a brilliant device that is used by George Eliot to merge two disparate tales of Dorothea and Lydgate. So uh, all these characters who live in Middle March, how do they all come together? How does the uh, writer weave all of these characters together? One of the techniques that she uses is to a stage a dinner party where all of these characters come together. And using a range of middle March residents, Elliot presents local concerns, predilections in a small town engaged in social gossip, politics, and current news. Uh, reform bills, uh, marriage of Casabon, Dorothea, Ladislaw, Lydgate, etc. are discussed. So uh, all the topics that we as readers are thinking about, they're all discussed during the dinner meeting. Narrative techniques like uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, where innkeeper pilgrims and their conversations give information about medieval English society. And sure, you've already started studying Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, right? What is the narrative structure in that? the innkeeper and the pilgrims and the stories that each one narrates right on the way to Canterbury Shrine of Canterbury. So that is like a structure there and you get to see a good picture of the society at that time uh, painted through the words of these characters. So the same sort of thing happens here during the dinner party when you have a number of uh, people, number of inhabitants of Middlemarch coming together and all their concerns, all the local news and gossip and everything is discussed. Uh, George Eliot is an omniscient narrator. One who knows everything, you know, the narrator who knows everything. Then uh, the outsider. The man of modern medicine, Tertius Lydgate. So he, he is, you know, he wants to be an insider, but he is always considered an outsider. Lydgate's vision of the betterment of health and his desire to see reform in medical systems gives him the necessary resolve. A small town offers him an opportunity, and his idealism and thought is not matched by his action. So he comes to Middlemarch with the loftiest of ideals uh, to really devote his life and career to the advancement of science to his research, etc. But his lofty ideals are not matched by his actions. He is vulnerable to emotionality, even though he claims to be on the scientific quest. So one of the first things that he associates with science is rationalism. But uh, for Lydgate, he falls for emotionality, and that uh, becomes evident uh, in his marriage to Rosamond. That changes his entire life. The angel of light. So Will Ladislaw, the uh, nephew or, or the cousin of um, Cossaburn who becomes closer to uh, Dorothea. Will Ladislaw painted a, a set, a much disliked cousin of Cossaburn, 
whom Dorothea innocently befriends during her wedding journey in Rome. So at first their friendship was innocent. Okay, she was uh, a bored wife, young wife, and uh, Lil Ladislaw was someone who was full of laughter and energy to take her around and show her the place. And this started in Rome. Dorothea innocently builds comparisons between her old scholarly husband and the charming young Bohemian. The first impression on seeing Will was one of sunny brightness. Casabon, on the other hand, stood rayless. You can see the contrast there. One is bright and sunny, the other is dark and rayless. He lacks any intellectual or moral depths that can match Dorothea's ardor for the upliftment of the poor community. His seductive charm relies substantially on his ability to play with words. So Ladislaw does not have like uh, so much of depth, as much depth as uh, Dorothea has for the upliftment of the poor and other topics like that. Yet he is very engaging. His charm lies entirely on his way to play with words. And uh, Dorothea, who is denied conversations at home, you know, falls for this companionship that Will Ladislaw offers her. It is an easy companionship with a related stranger who, along with word making, has a gift, a gift for laughter at the absurd dimensions of human behavior. So this is how their friendship develops. Critics have been hard on Ladislaw, but to her, he is a halo of light, a matter of money. Are you all with me? Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, all right. Then, uh, a matter of money. A character in fiction is presented through uh, at least three kinds of perception. What uh, the person says about the self, what others individually or collectively advance as their assessment, and how the author intervenes from a vantage point. So this is how, like when you're asked in your uh, examination for character analysis, you know, how do you make a character analysis? See, when you read about the character, find out, you know, what does the character say about himself or herself, about the self? Then what do other characters in the, uh, in the novel or in the play, whichever book, you know, what do the others say about this character? whether they talk individually about this character or together, collectively about this character. So what is their assessment of the character? Then a third way is how the author presents to us this character from the vantage point, from the uh, advantageous point of the author. How is this character presented to us? So these are the ways in which we go deeper into an analysis of a character, whether it is in a nova, novel or a play, whichever it is. Now, Elliot presents the character of Mr. Bulstrode through early hints of mystery, guilt, power, hunger, as seen in the court. It was a principle with Mr. Bulstrode to gain as much power as possible that he might use it for the glory of God. He went through a great deal of spiritual conflict and inward argument in order to adjust his motives and to make clear to himself what God's glory required from uh, page 184-85. So when you read that quote, you understand, you know, that uh, there are hints of mystery and guilt and uh, also hunger for power hidden in his words. So the, this is a way in which, you know, the, the author builds the character of a person and we learn to analyze this character. Then, a nod to literary tradition. Now, George Eliot's adopting a male pseudonym to be linked to the expectations of the critics of the time. When Middlemarch was published, her identity was well known. She tried to achieve the uh, range considered appropriate in a realist novel by giving details of scientific development, political processes, and industrial progress, since these were subjects women were not supposed to know about. Okay, So we know that she wrote under the pseudonym George Eliot. But by the time this book came out, her real name and identity were already known. And also she makes it a point to write in a way that a man would have written, you know, like uh, by writing about topics that was not expected of a woman writer to understand or know, like writing about science, writing about po political processes, writing about industrial progress. These were topics that 
were considered by uh, the men uh, to be out of you know the range of a woman writer but george eliot proved them wrong by writing about all these things eliot wants us to know that women writers can overcome the limits on knowledge that society has placed upon them recalling plato david lodge adapts plato's term mimesis and digesis to the novel so two terms mimesis and digesis mimesis is narrating by imitating another speech and digesis is narrating in one's own voice so middle march uses dialogue and description <clears throat> in order to build up the story so through dialogues you know we are shown what is happening nobody is telling us sometimes there is the author's account of an interior monologue revealing thoughts unknown to the dramatist person so Uh, it's more of nemesis than digesis that you see here because through the words and uh, dialogues of the characters we come to know what they are thinking and what is happening and sometimes another feature that uh, the writer uses is interior monologue what the characters thinking within their mind that comes uh, in the form of an interior monologue so that gives us an idea or a peek into the mind of the dramatist person or the character uh i think someone else is presenting can you see my slide no ma'am uh someone else is presenting let me see let me start broadcast you know all of these Okay, can you see the stack? Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, so we uh, we were talking about mimesis and digesis. Okay, mimesis is uh, narrating through imitating another speech, whereas digesis is narrating through one's own voice. So here we see uh, the writer presenting to us. the dialogues through the characters so narrating through mimetic forms right uh, then going on to the next topic here philosophical underpinnings transitions made in the novel from the subject of youthful idealism to the disillusionment induced by experience uh, waiting for death in that is book 3 of the novel Uh, several changes are recorded in the dynamics of social and personal attachment for sabon who has been dismissed as a great bladder for dried peas to rattle in an aged dedicated scholar determined to write his magnum opus a key to all mythologies so uh, we know like by that time waiting for death you know book 3 we understand that cosabon is just you know a, a bag of dried peas to rattle in so like a lot of noise but nothing happens okay and we understand that his magnum opus uh, a key to all mythologies is uh, never going to be achieved so casabon had had misjudged his compatibility with dorothea just as she had so we can say that dorothea went into marriage not doing anything so maybe look at it from casabon side he also did not expect uh, you know Dorothea to be like this. Okay, he has had also probably misjudged his compatibility with this young wife. Even during their stay in Rome, he had developed an uncomfortable feeling of being spied upon and being sus- suspected of pursuing a fruitless endeavor. He uh, could feel, you know, how his attitude, how his young wife's attitude towards him was changing. Uh, he could feel that, you know, she is sort of spying on him. and he did not feel comfortable with that and also he uh, kind of sensed the disapproval that she was feeling that she had lost faith in this uh, endeavor that he was uh, trying you know this big book magnum opus that he was trying to write he was irritated by her proximity yet jealous of her absence so he did not want her near him yet not far from him either with the arrival of ladislaw things worsened is Cosabon, a character who deserves our pity or not, is a question that we ask ourselves. Uh, then we can also see um, the difference between uh, Lydgate and Cosabon. 
the doctor and the social worker both desire improvements in the lives of others right uh, the egotistical scholar covets fame for himself so uh, whether it is dorokia wanting you know wanting the upliftment of the poor and everything or it is a doctor who wants to contribute towards advancement of science they all want something for society but what does this egotistical scholar cosabon want he wants to write a book for which he will get renowned he will get famous so this is something that he is doing for himself there is a di di distinction between the two right there uh, one is for the benefit of others whereas the other one is for selfish purposes so in the light of cosabon's failing health self reflection for dorothea uh, memory guilt fear repressed hostility helplessness resolve and a multitude of related emotions battle for primacy in her review of her marriage with cosabon so she feels uh, sort of guilty for probably on some level having uh, ignored her husband Uh, Dorothea's desire to give primacy to her husband's need is met with the cold, mean reticence on Cosbon's part. So when she tries to give him attention, uh, he, it's only met with coldness from Cosbon's part. Her innocence, which does not permit her to see Ladislaus's attentions, is a strong cause of Cosbon's rudeness, uh, Cosbon's egotism. awareness of his failure in scholarly pursuit and doubt regarding dorothea's loyalty is what troubles him so they are never very, very compatible with each other dorothea does not understand that cosabon feels insecure uh, in the presence of ladislaw and uh, cosabon does not understand that uh, you know uh, dorothea is uh, loyal to him and wants to help him so they are an incompatible pair then a hidden subject so attraction between will and dorothea has a sexual aspect though not admitted in the surface text of the novel uh, the dry intellection of uh, cosabon and his distaste for any kind of bodily touch is mentioned in the book so he doesn't like anybody touching him which is just the contrast as far as will is concerned okay will ladislaw on the other hand he speaks of body color taste sound albeit in the context of art he ta he talks about it not with uh, um with explicit sexuality but rather in the context of art but then uh, this was a way only way in which you know uh, in, during the victorian times uh, a, a writer could talk about sexuality because it was always implied it was never written explicitly Uh, again now we come to two feminist critics sandra gilbert and susan gubar who uh, in their ground breaking book mad woman in the attic demonstrated that women writers had to resort to indirect ways to speak of unmentionable subjects such as female sexuality and that madness for instance was a meta language for unfulfilled desire in women so uh, i think we mentioned this book in wuthering heights also a uh, mad woman in the attic you know became like almost a symbol for all that was repressed all that women could not explore or speak about openly uh, so uh, in many of these books including uh, wuthering heights you know um, i mean uh, jane i you see especially in jane i you see this mad woman locked up in the attic uh, metaphorically speaking that could be an emblem of uh, repression of the woman's character of how she is uh, prevented from exploring or writing or speaking about female sexuality so this madness is, uh, actually becomes a meta language for unfulfilled desire in women then uh, so springs of love you know three love problems in book 4 uh, the title is three love problems so uh, three love problems is created by the deaths of kesabon featherstar both controlling men who reach beyond death through legal injunctions laid down in their wills kesabon reaches beyond death to uh, restrict uh, the intimacy between dorothea and will ladislaw and featherstone uh, he was supposed to give his uh, inheritance to fred 
but he uh, changes his mind at the last minute and gives all his money to his uh, illegitimate son so fred is left without an inheritance so the you know deaths of these characters has re- has uh, effects beyond the time that they died so the theme of love variously interpreted and enacted links three disparate stories in book 4 of middle march that of fred and mary gard that of rosamond and lidgate and cosabon and dorothea mary's integrity at the cost of her personal happiness mary belongs to a lower uh, rung of uh, rung of society uh, uh, george eliot is telling us that integrity and idealism can be personal attributes separate from class so mary is seen as an example of a woman with integrity because she tells fred that if uh, fred joins the clergy a profession to which he is unsuited she will not marry him she wants him to uh, find work learn a trade find a work and uh, uh, earn a living uh, in an honest manner so we can say that you know the strength of character that mary got uh, displays is something that uh, eliot wants to tell us that you know uh, such integrity and idealism is not uh, related with social status and can go to any section of society because mary is from the ro- lower ranks of society in contrast to the moral stability of the garth family the winces are shown to be people who will ride upon opportunities to improve their material and social standing winci uh, fred is good hearted but he is also like that and so is rosamond winci so they are people who will ride on anything so as to you know uh, satisfy their material urges and their social standing yet in contrast is the family of caleb gard and his daughter mary gard the appearance of wealth and class is more important than intrinsic worth uh, and elite's criticism of that social climbers is implicit in it so society and how she depicts that now bill and dorothea's blossoming relationship thrives upon the soil of reformist doctrine provided by mr brook uh, mr brook is uh, the uncle of uh, dorothea who's uh, uh, who gives ladislaw a job of editing he is embarking upon a political career so uh, bill and dorothea's blooming relationship thrives upon the soil of the reformist doctrine provided by Mr Brook she confides in him her greatest desires and dreams for improvement of the people and Dorothea's idealism is strong but we witness her helplessness as she lacks the means to effect change directly and must depend upon the advocacy of the men in her life so as a woman she is she has her own restrictions and she is also dependent on the men uh, in order to advance her ideals as a bond the awareness of his wife's attachment for ladislaw causes more than just jealousy his summary of her tendency is fairly accurate she is ready prey to any man who knows how to play adroitly so this is the way in which uh, cosabon looks at his wife that you know she can be taken advantage of are women dependent so this is a question that it raises uh, is ladislaw an opportunity opportunist is cassabon protective or jealous questions that george eliot raises before us then the author and her influences although george eliot has often been called a moralist she wishes to engage the reader in a discussion on the general on the general condition of human kind george eliot was deeply influenced by the intellectual theories of her time especially those connected with determinism now what is determinism the affairs of the world are already determined and therefore not much scope exists for human responsibility that kind of idea is what we call as determinism it's already predetermined that sort of idea now despite the overall determinism equations of cause and effect operate in matters of human choice to some extent therefore an individual is free and responsible for action so there is overall determinism but even then you know uh, uh, equations of cause and effect operate in matters of human choice right and to some extent an individual is free and responsible for action although not 
fully free there is some element of uh, freedom of will and choice in the human being determinism though a philosophic theory is manifest in the daily routines and destinies of people human will is a potent force that informs conduct while it cannot alter a deterministic universe it it directs moral behavior relating to duty obligation and responsibility so uh, uh, human will is a very powerful force you know that can uh, uh, that can determine how we behave how we conduct ourselves yeah. while it cannot alter the course of universe it, it like from the deterministic point of view when everything is already determined and pre uh, determined uh, it cannot alter the way in which the universe is moving still there is a, a element of human will which can play its own power on that uh, and it is this uh, power that you know makes a human being act according to obligations and duty and responsibility since individual will is related to the determined path of mankind a complex web uh, reacts to exercises of power and action at any point the structure of society is organic that every part is necessary for the action of the whole so uh, individual will is related to the determined part of mankind in some in in some uh, level our will is already linked and connected to the already predetermined part of mankind Uh, and from this we can say a sort of complex web reacts to exercises of power and action at any point the structure of society is organic where every part is necessary for the action of the whole so what individuals do actually adds up and counts to what the society does on a whole uh, which through the deterministic point of view is already predetermined yet we can say that individual actions do have a role in it egotism isolates individuals while relatedness to society brings spiritual upliftment so only when uh, you think of connecting with uh, with everyone around you then only does spiritual upliftment come right not uh, in, in an egotistic person who isolates himself the universe is governed by principles of fundamental equality differences are culturally or locally precipitated ordinary and heroic lives are a matter of perception not a given condition of a deterministic universe therefore changes in status are very likely and flux and fluidity compose ordinary lives within a rigid fixed universe historical processes are dynamic uh, they are things that are live right historical processes are things that are uh, alive things that are being made even as we speak so uh, to george eliot the religion of humanity mattered more than any other form of devoutness she also understands the world in darwinian terms hence idealistic character like dorothea also characters like rosamond bulstrode who have to adapt and accept consequences of earlier action so you you have characters like dorothea who uh, understands the world in uh, idealistic conditions idealistic character uh, like her and also characters like mulstrode and rosamond who had to suffer for their actions and learn to adapt uh, george eliot's ideas were derived from three major thinkers okay the first one is auguste comte <coughs> was a french philosopher and moralist who in 1838 first used the term sociology uh, he is the founder of positivism he conceived a method of study based on observation and restricted to the observable auguste comte then the second uh, influence on eliot's ideas uh, is darwin darwin darwinian you know a book the controversial book origin of species written in 1859 which challenged many of the suppositions of the bible it argued that species changed and adapt according to the environment so these were the authors in the books that were speaking to her uh, the basis of her mental processes and mental outlook the third uh, authors ludwig andreas forbach 
who was a German materialist philosopher and critic of religion. His seminal work, The Essence of Christianity, published in 1954, was translated by George Eliot. And she was very deeply influenced by its questions of questioning of dogma. So he stated that religion was a human construction and there was a need to take back what had been believed to be divine directives. So uh, Forbach questions uh, religion and questions, uh, you know, uh, what religion does. He is of the opinion that religion is something which is entirely created by mankind. And that leads uh, George Eliot also to question all the divine directives. So these were the three uh, uh, writers and thinkers who majorly influenced Eliot's own ideas. Uh, then uh, the next uh, point, uh, Terry Eagleton's important essay, George Eliot, Ideology and Literary Form, alleges that the author diffuses and represses the potential tragic collision between corporate and individualist ideologies. So, uh, talking about the ideology and literary form, you know, uh, the author diffuses and represses the potential tragic collision between the corporate forms, corporate is the capitalist, and the individualist ideology. Uh, so, the, uh, the industrialist versus the workers, you can say, right? Elliot is aware of the conflict and therefore in control of the narrative. The unresolved confusion of values adds to the richness of the novel. So uh, she doesn't uh, think of, you know, taking it to a sort of well-defined uh, uh, ending, well-defined conclusion, but that only adds to the richness of the voices that you find presented in the book. In principle, the romantic individualism of Dorothea tries to exercise a choice in preserving some independent space for herself, knowing as she does the harsh appropriating nature of Cossabon. And Cossabon's will contains the dreadful codicil that casts an ugly shadow upon Dorothea's friendship with Ladislaw. Uh, and overexpression of free spirit will cause ethical imbalance and social disarmony, tear the fabric of society upon which laws of institutions such as uh, marriage is built. The community as something moral, okay? Uh, V.S. Pritchett, another um, critic, this is what he says about Middlemarch. Middlemarch is the first of many novels about groups of people in provincial towns. Uh, they are differentiated from each other, not by class or fortune, but by their moral history, which is planned and has its own inner hierarchy. So, uh, look at this. Uh, Caleb Gard. You know, it's an example. Uh, he tells Fred very clearly, most lucidly, you must be sure of two things. You must love your work and not always look over the edge of it, wanting your play to begin. And the other is that you must not be ashamed of your work and think it would be more honorable to do something else. So Mary has been brought up on these principles. These are sound principles, right? To be... Uh, to be uh, to love your work and not be ashamed of the work that you do. So Mary has been brought up on these principles and seeing her affection for Fred, Caleb tries to Caleb that is her father tries to correct certain attitudes in the profligate young man. So Fred has a lot of growing up to do. Fred has been wasting money, living the life of you know uh, a, a, a youngster given up to the pleasures of life. And it is only when he does not get the money that he was expecting from Featherstone, he realizes that life must change now. And, uh, and Mary is responsible for that. So uh, restraint, decorum, and ethics are not exclusive to people defined by class, education, or material condition. Example, Mr. Fairbrother. So he is also uh, someone who, uh, who he, was, uh, he was in love with Mary. But when he realizes Fred is also, uh, you know, in uh, giving her attention, he gracefully moves back. Then George Eliot and the woman question. Uh, Kate Millett, the author of Sexual Politics, another feminist writer. Sexual Politics is another seminal uh, work of feminist uh, criticism. Uh, 
uh, came up with the charge that George Eliot had lived the feminist revolution but had not written about it. The uh, date of the setting of the book is around 1830 and the date of composition was 1870. So things happening at the time. One, uh, the feminist awareness. Two, the passage of the reform bill. Now the action of Middle March takes place between September 1829 and May 1832 or 40 years before its publication, which is in 71-72. Eliot lived through a feminist revolution, but the episodes in the novel predate many of the significant events. According to Gillian Beard, another writer, in the 1840s, the emphasis in England was on realizing fully the special moral influences of women. Home is given considerable importance as the value systems of society are expected to be introduced, nurtured, and strengthened by the wife, the mother, and the lady of the house. Uh, the main event in 1850s was the Married Women's Property Bill. So George Eliot signed a petition in favor of it. The point emphasized was that in entering the state of marriage, they no longer pass from freedom into the condition of a slave. Now, uh, until then, you know, like when the woman married all that she had all her belongings would go to the husband but then with the you know uh, passing of the uh, married women's property bill it was stated that when she enters marriage she does not go from a state of freedom to a state of being a slave so uh, george Eliot also signed this petition for the bill to be passed 1860 saw an emphasis on the education of women in the early pages of Middle March, references made to unsatisfactory girlish instruction given to the serious and purposeful Dorothea. So those days, girls were not allowed to have education. You know, they were not uh, the only education that they were allowed to have was uh, to uh, cook and sew and take care of children. You know, anything that would make them a good housewife, uh, a good housekeeper. Uh, you know. T taking care of household responsibilities. They were not, in fact, allowed to go to um, uh, college or school or, you know, any place uh, where they had to study something like mathematics and law and things like that. They were not even allowed to study, especially because uh, they were, uh, you know, they thought the people, especially the men at that time, thought that these are places which would build a spirit of competitiveness amongst the uh, learners. And sense of competition was not something that they wanted a woman to have, especially a woman who was expected to become a, a housewife, uh, one who was expected to listen to the words of her husband. So this was not something that they wanted a woman to have. It was only much later that the woman was allowed to study and earn a degree of her own. George Eliot's connection with the woman question remained equivocal. <clears throat> like, you know, not unequivocal, equivocal. Though she showed support for the married women's property bill and was a good friend to several activists of this time, she never joined women's movement directly. So she, she was not as active as would be expected of a woman, uh, of a writer of her stage. Using the Gothic. Uh, the classic realism of the principal plot of uh, Middle March is offset by Eliot's use of Gothic elements of the story of Bulstrode and Raffles. Uh, so, uh, Gothic elements, we discuss Gothic elements when we discuss uh, Wuthering Heights, right? Uh, usually, you know, it has uh, elements of heightened emotions expressed through exaggerated characters and set in a place, uh, the location is where you know supernatural elements have a free play this is typically the what is meant by a gothic setting so here you find gothic elements in the story of bulstrode and raffles like you know a darker shade to the story will ladislaw is to gain prominence as the story proceeds to its denoma uh, to the ending denoma uh, example, Wynne's ancestry and Bulstrode's criminal past, the sinister Raffles, who hints at knowledge about mysterious events in the past relating to Will's unknown origins. So now we know, right, the, uh, the dark deed in Bulstrode's past. That is what brings shades of the Gothic into this book. 
uh, Bulstrode uh, having denied Bill Ladislaw the true inheritance, uh, you know, the, the money that he was really the inheritor of. So that, that was something that brings in the Gothic elements to it. And uh, talking about Denoma, uh, so uh, this is, you know, what you see there on the um, slide is a fray tags pyramid. It's a method of structuring a story by mapping the progression of conflict from inception, that is the beginning, to the resolution. Now, uh, look at the structure of uh, the graph there. See, it starts uh, from the left side of that image. See, it starts from exposition, that is background information of the plot, which includes characters and setting. And then we go to the initial uh, incident, that is, uh, the first incident that uh, creates the conflict and then you have rising action where there are three major events that add to suspense attention to the plot and complications or frustrations which again goes you know takes the action further up to the climax which is a most suspenseful part of the plot and the turning point for the protagonist character uh, and then we have a uh, falling action. Again, you see like three events or maybe even less than three events, which unravel the conflict, which open up the conflict between the protagonist and the antagonist, which leads to the resolution. So the conflict being solved, that is the next stage, the resolution stage. The conflict is resolved and we discover whether the protagonist achieves their goal or not. And then we have uh, the denouma, which is the uh, tying up of all loose ends, where all the loose ends of the story is tied together. So this is a typical uh, fray tax pyramid of how a story progresses, starting from uh, giving us information about the characters, then taking us towards uh, points of conflict, which takes us to the uh, top of the pyramid, which is the climax. And once, the, once we reach the climax, uh, there is this conflict between the protagonist and the antagonist, which uh, leads to the falling action, uh, leading to resolution, that is uh, solving the problems between uh, the protagonist and the antagonist and uh, solving the issues there. And final thing is the denouma, where all the loose threads are tied up. So this is a free tax figure. So uh, as the story goes towards the denoma, Ladislaw gains more and more importance in the story. And uh, Bulstrode and you know the others are the ones that create the conflicts here. Then going on to the next one, a critical change. Bulstrode had married an older woman, Mrs. Dunker, the wealthy widow of a man with whom he had worked in an unscrupulous pawnbroker's business. Before marrying him, Mrs. Dunkirk had wanted to find her runaway daughter and her son. With an eye on the Dunkirk fortune, Bulstrode had bribed uh, Raffles, uh, and the only other person to know Sarah's whereabouts, to keep silent. Uh, and when Mrs. Uh, Dunkirk died, uh, Bulstrode, as her husband, had inherited all her money. Moving to the provincial town of Middlemarch, he had married Harriet Quincy and became a wealthy and apparently respectable banker. When Bill learns about the past, he angrily rejects Bulstrode's offer of money to amend the wrongdoings of the past. He strikes a blow at hierarchical structures, both personal and institutional. So this is a story of Bulstrode, right? How he um, cheats Mrs. Dunkirk. And after she passes, takes all her money, goes to Middlemarch in this provincial town where no one knows him and settles down there, uh, pretending to be honest and everything. He becomes a banker and he marries uh, uh, ma marries Harriet Vincy. And that is how uh, he comes to be living in Middlemarch. But when Raffles comes, uh, all this uh, story, all the evil deeds that he has done, uh, is on the verge of being revealed. So that is uh, how uh, we reach, we understand about Will Ladislaw's past and um, uh, what happens to him, the money that he inherits. Then the finale. 
uh, linking motives are several. Two of them, reforms and money. Another device for creating a cohesive structure is the use of the metaphor, especially the metaphor of the web in the text, uh, and how it may be rendered also as a labyrinth, an organic tissue, or a woven fabric. So, uh, linking motives, you know, the repeated, repeatedly occurring patterns that you find in uh, the story. Two of them, reforms and money. And another uh, device for creating, uh, you know, a binding structure is through the use of metaphor. In this case, it is a metaphor of the web here. Uh, like you can see, 1832, the first reform act, reformed the antiquated electoral system in Britain by redistributing seats and changing the condition of the franchise. And reform in medicine was an important development in Europe. Lid Gates ideas for systematizing medical practice is opposed by the tradition traditional doctors and their patients. Reform for Dorothea is linked to the betterment of the lives of the poor. It's like a web, isn't it? Each one connecting with the other. So reform, then reform in medical uh, field, then reform to, for the betterment of the lives of the poor. And the doctor and Dorothea get into sporadic connections. He is as much an essential part of her story as she is of his. Another linking motive is that of money. Lidgate's idea for new hospital. Established doctors have their usual rich patients. Lidgate's patients are poor. And uh, the idea does not work because of the opposition faced by these rich doctors. Uh, opposition Lidgate uh, faces from these rich doctors. And Rosamond, her high expectations have led Lidgate to death. When Raffles appears, Bull's truth's past surfaces. Lidgate's reputation also suffers after uh, Raffles' death. So Dorothea is the one who has faith in him. So look at the way in which their stories come together. Uh, Dorothea is the one who still has faith and belief in uh, the innocence of Lidgate. She, in fact, becomes an agent of transformation for Lidgate, Rosamond, and Ladislaw. She's able to bring change in their lives. Then uh, the linguistic texture of Middlemarch is permeated with figurality as poetic metaphoric imagery, also through vocabulary and technicality of signs. Uh, Lidgate's research is connected to the metaphor of the web in his attempt to find primitive tissue, the first tissue that might have given rise to life. That is a primitive tissue that he is uh, researching. And uh, again, see, it is like a web, right? Again, we can, going back to this metaphor of the web. Web metaphor brings into open the parallelism between Eliot's aim as a sociologist of provincial life and the aims of the contemporary biologist. So Eliot herself is like connecting a web, web here, right? A web of uh, the sociological life as seen through the, you know, uh, life in middle March. So she is also weaving a web, uh, almost like the kind of web that these biologists are uh, looking into to find the origin of life. Rosamond is showing, uh, spinning a web. Here it's a web of romance. Uh, dominant metaphors are often contradicted by suggestions of an opposite kind. A web or the labyrinth images of entrapment or imprisonment are often used regarding Dorothea's flight. So uh, uh, labyrinth, uh, labyrinth is like, you know, you, you can, it's like a maze. Uh, you get into a labyrinth and you can very well become uh, imprisoned by the labyrinth. You can get totally lost in the labyrinth and never be able to come out. Uh, so uh, in this case, the web also becomes something like a labyrinth and it can be a metaphor for Dorothea's plight. At the same time, optical imagery as of light and windows. So another metaphor that you see is uh, the optical imagery of light in windows, which means a looking out from one's prison. Uh, that is given special significance. <clears throat> so scientific vocabulary and imagery applies also to the changing relationship between Lidgate and Rosamond. Uh, for example, Lidgate the jellyfish which gets melted without knowing it. So 
see how that scientific vocabulary is used there scientific imagery is used there like gate line blind uh, like a jellyfish which does not realize it's getting melted or rosamond is seen as a torpedo whose benumbing contact paralyzes lidgate so you find uh, eliot using all these scientific imageries and metaphors also then there are some uh, minor characters uh, in the book uh, see uh, one is mrs uh, cadwallader uh, she is the wife of the uh, rector she is a gossip uh, and she is shrewd and talkative and full of worldly wisdom her uh, pitiless remarks spare only a few then there is mr brook who is the uncle of dorothea he is well meaning in a sweeping sort of way but he is ineffective then there is celia brook uh, she is a conventional young woman the sister of dorothea uh, she is seeking the time honored comforts of a husband and a domestic heart with her traditional minded husband sir james chetta Uh, Caleb Garth, that is Mary Garth's father, whose simplicity and goodness offers a foil to a number of others, remains emblematic of the positive value of work. So Mary Garth and Caleb Garth are two figures that you see here, coming from a lower strata of society, yet emblematic of the positive effects of honest work. Then you have Mrs. Bulstrode. Uh, is shown as behaving bravely and admirably in the face of Bulstrode's disgrace. So when uh, the town comes to know of the dark deed in Bulstrode's past, everyone uh, kind of you know distances themselves from him. But Mrs. Bulstrode is shown as behaving bravely and admirably in spite of the uh, disgrace that her husband is facing. linking her with the suffering of women as wives controlled by the decisions of their men so she can be seen as an emblem of how women suffer from uh, the decisions and actions taken by their husbands or the men in their lives the minor characters can be taken as representing character traits that constitute the diverse forces of a society so uh, like you, you remember the plenitude that we talked about we find Uh, so many character traits being embodied in the minor characters in this book now eliot was a self conscious artist carefully crafting her text she wished to engage active participation from her readers in the full understanding of her story set in the reform era in england though readers today are removed from her in time and history social forces have other directions they are still intrigued by the openness of middle march and in the finale dorothea's story culminates her marriage to will ladislaw an intricate link is established with uh, lidgate's research on primitive tissues and bulstrode's inability to escape the past and there are critics who have um, uh, criticized how Eli, uh, george eliot did not think of offering uh, anything to her uh, heroine other than ending in marriage with will ladislaw Dorothea, given the uh, high level of intelligence and uh, you know the kind of uh, earnestness that she has invested in uh, her central character, uh, finally she this story culminates in her marriage to Bill Ladislaw. So there are uh, critics who have questioned that also. Why why would you know a, a heroine uh, have to end up like that? so this, this is uh, what this novel is about now uh, going to our yeah let me stop sharing now okay so uh yeah and i'm reading the messages in call messages here now yeah i did have i mean we had to be like we were interrupted with some power cut uh things here i mean from my side okay yeah okay yeah. 
is there anything that you want to ask me otherwise we can end the class Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Because <laughs> there was only total silence from your side. So shall we call it a day? Okay. I think uh, um, since uh, there are no more questions. i think we can call it a day and i'll see you next week okay uh, uh, as soon as the class ends i'll try to send you some uh, more links to uh, understanding this uh, novel more and more okay all right then so i'll see you next class then bye bye thank you thank you thank you bye 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 take care